Well, here it is. It is Friday. This is the Preterist Power Hour, our time of going live, talking with you for an hour of power regarding the truth, the advancement, the uh, clarity, healing, and strategy, if you will, uh, that has come forth from preterism, the understanding that all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled and that we are living in the reality that Christ has prepared for his people. Uh, I'm excited to move in on today as today is a holy day or a holiday, depending on how you want to say that. And uh, we get to move in on some discussion uh, in that regard. So I'm excited to be here with you. But just in case you don't know who I am and you're tuning into this program, I'm Mike Miano. I'm the co-host of this program with my brother Edward, who will introduce himself in a moment. And I serve as pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church and director of the Power of Preterism Network. This program is provided to you as a ministry through the Power of Preterism Network, which you can learn more about by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Edward, good morning, brother. I'm going to go ahead and hand the time over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Excuse me. It's always an honor and privilege to co-host with Pastor Mike Miniano. My name is Edward Howell. I'm a member of the Blue Point Bible Church, also a board member of the Power of Preterism Network. Uh, at this time, I would like to lead us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time we have in this Preterist Power Hour to empower those listeners as well as ourselves. Thank you for this uh, season in which you uh, sacrifice yourself for on our behalf. Uh, we thank you, thank and praise you for that. Um, uh, thank you for the enlightened, uh, clarity-based uh, message that will be presented about this holiday season, uh, and also um, hopefully that it will come with clarity where we can uh, glean from it and uh, share it with one another and discuss it, you know, open up conversation, you know, share what, what we've come to understand from the message, our understanding with others and develop fellowship in Jesus name, amen. Amen, thank you, brother. I appreciate that as you rightly noted, you know, we do hope that this is edifying to others and most of all, uh, well, not most of all, but of importance is that we get edified as well. So. Uh, I know I'm always edified by our time of fellowship with each other, as well as with our guests, and even the comments that are made on Facebook uh, that I get to read through, or, or YouTube for that matter, that I get to read through and uh, think about and ponder. So always appreciative of this time that we've marked out. So uh, yes, uh, today is Good Friday. So you know, right there, that's a Catholic tradition, of course, uh, carried over into other traditions, other Protestant traditions. So uh, I want to say happy or good Friday to you. And then, of course, as the sun goes down later this evening, the Jewish community will be celebrating Passover. And uh, in that, I get to say Chag Samiak, which is happy festival. And uh, we'll be celebrating here, of course, at the Blue Point Bible Church, a Messianic Passover dinner, Messianic Seder. And I look forward to leaning in on that. So it should be no surprise to everyone that we're going to talk a little bit about the Feast of the Lord this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about Passover, talk about preterism, which, again, this is the Preterist Power Hour. That shouldn't be a surprise. And we'll lean in on a little bit from uh, about Good Friday. So it is flashback, flash forward Friday. So we hope that we highlight resources for you, as well as announcements uh, that will highlight further edification in uh, your life. So I want to say good morning again to all of you that are tuned in through social media. Uh, and thank you, of course, to those of you that have tuned in here through our session. Um, Edward, I have to, I just want to share a quote. This kind of sets the stage for what I think we'll talk about today. Matter of fact, before I do that, let's, let's do a review. Uh, yesterday, I thank you for joining with me as we began to talk a bit about uh, the Christian worldview and uh, Edward, you had left us when we were moving through the outline of chapter 21, uh, talking about the Bible and, uh, you know, what the value of the Bible is in regards to a Christian life. We went through and we talked about a couple other details of uh, creation and human life. Uh, we talked about uh, Christian missions and evangelism and how we need to have a comprehensive worldview. And I appreciate our other director uh, with the Power of Preterism Network, Jonathan Buttrey, his comments was that we have a lot of work to do, you know, and we do. We have a lot of work to do in regards to helping people come to, and even helping ourselves, come to a handle on what we're saying as a community, uh, what is the gospel we're bringing forth. 
And, uh, you know, what, what are we taking our stand upon and what, what are the hills that we're dying upon, so to speak, and uh, helping people understand that. So, and then where can and how, what is our ethic of understanding things and treating things that we don't agree with, uh, I think is another conversation that we need to have as well. So um, that being said, uh, I encourage people to go back, listen to yesterday's program. Uh, we are going to, you know, do a push in the near future, having a whole week possibly, uh, or quite a few sessions, depending on how that all works out, talking about covenant creation and talking about, you know, th this book beyond creation science, but carrying it a bit further. As I appreciated, Richard and I had a little bit of discussion yesterday at the end of the program where we talked about the book says, you know, it gives you the very foundational understanding of the view that has come to be called covenant creation. Uh, you, you know, beyond creation science, as I read through the book, I didn't necessarily get this uh, view that it was being kind of create a monolithic view that was being created. Rather, it seemed as though the book was just challenging contemporary assumptions uh, in regards to what the Bible teaches and showing you what the Bible actually does say. So, and in and, and highlighting different frame of thought. Since then, there's been discussion forums and Facebook forums and Facebook groups that have developed further thought. And as we know, Edward, you, you know, you put five men in a group and you let them kind of you know, ponder a bunch of details, especially things like Genesis, uh, writings from 10,000 years ago, if you will, uh, then, yeah, you're going to get a couple different answers from different people in different areas, different nuances. Even, you know, we talk about that here in regards to, you know, our effort where we've brought on guests that have different nuances or say things that we might not necessarily say in that manner or, or agree with. Uh, but we've learned how to find, you know, a uh, sort of, uh, understanding that we're going to say things differently and we're okay with that as long as we can aim toward the foundation which again we would highlight being jesus christ and the scriptures that testify to him and of course the spirit in our lives and the spirit that bears witness to the teachings of jesus that are mentioned through the scripture so we believe there's a threefold witness in regards to uh, our foundation the scriptures jesus and the spirit and uh, do you think that's a good a good uh, expression there edward Oh, definitely, you know, because that that should always be the common ground, you Amen. know, in which in which you know we should all believe, you know, calling ourselves Christians, you know, having our foundation in Jesus Christ. That's right. That's right. So, uh, just a quick review of tomorrow uh, of uh, yesterday's program or some resources from yesterday's program, and then I'll move us in on what we want to talk about today. So. Uh, the book Beyond Creation Science, we highlighted chapter 21 yesterday. Now, if you want to read that and you want to obtain it, you could, of course, go to Amazon and buy a copy of the book, or you can contact me or contact Tim Martin, Jeff Vaughn, and there's a PDF that is available that you can gain. They'll email it to you free of charge, most likely, and uh, allow you to uh, utilize that resource uh, for your edification. So, uh, I want to, or Tony Denton is someone else, I believe, that has also made it available. So, uh, or you can contact me and I will uh, get that out to you. That's the Beyond Creation Science PDF. Now, to accompany that, Edward, I appreciate you bringing this to my attention earlier today, that to accompany the PDF P, uh, book that you might have, the Beyond Creation Science book, we've put together an outline book. Uh, again, I say we because it was a study uh, that culminated together here at the Blue Point Bible Church and online. Uh, going through the book and creating an outline. Uh, I share those details. I have a PDF file that I put together, uh, or you can find them all throughout the internet. If you put in, you know, Beyond Creation Science Study, go to YouTube, you can find the videos there. So all of those resources will be uh, available to you. Just simply email me, ask me for them. Uh, I know some of you already have, and I'll make those resources available to you later through email as well. So yeah, let's, let's move forward into our flashback, flash forward Friday. Uh, and Edward, this morning, I read a quote that I posted on social media a while back. It's a quote from Max King. And he said this, if we are going to understand the new covenant, which the spirit was making known, we must stay in the redemptive elements of the old covenant, because this is what the spirit of God did. And what he's ultimately getting at there is that the spirit of God was fulfilling the Old Testament. That's what we read, or the old covenant promises uh, we see in uh, Romans 15 is a text I regularly bring up where it says that Christ became a servant to the circumcision uh, to confirm the promises that were given to the fathers. That's the old covenant promises and for the Gentiles to glorify God for his mercy. 
because he was fulfilling the old covenant things. So that being said, when we talk about the new covenant, we talk about the promises we have in the new covenant. It's important to understand what was being hoped for under the old covenant. And it's only then, because again, Edward, you know this, there's people that believe the Bible's New Testament promises are about going somewhere, some other time, uh, you know, some other place for some other experience. And we sit there and say, well, no, it was about that experience coming here and being manifest through his people. And that's because people have not understood the old covenant hope. They have failed to understand what was hoped for in the old covenant and therefore have resupplied, if you will, their own understanding of what they think the new covenant promise is. Amen. You follow that point? Yes. And, and, and including in, in there a uh, hope, you know, it was not um, actually about going someplace else. They were talking about living here on earth. You know, a life, a life of, uh, uh, of that new covenant, you know, found in Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. uh, living here on earth, of tabernac God tabernacling with them That's here right. on earth, just living, you know, that, that life in the kingdom. Dare I say, uh, Deuteronomy 4 says, you know, a people of wisdom and understanding. That was the hope, to be a people of wisdom and understanding here on earth, not somewhere in heaven where we're floating around the clouds. Now we have all the wisdom and understanding. Well, that's great. But, you know, it, it's about having it here and having it manifest in us. So, matter of fact, Edward, if I might say this, uh, this morning, it's a holiday. So I want to encourage everyone, go ahead and listen to some good music today. And I took the opportunity to go ahead and listen to the Contemporary Christian Station. I have this uh, one, I go to my Alexa app, and I can say, uh, play Christian music, and she'll play Divine Sounds is the name of the program. So if anybody needs a, you know, a plug, there it is, Divine Sounds. And I'm listening this morning, two worship songs particularly came on. The first one, it was like, you want to talk about a God speaking to me moment. Uh, the first song, I'm forgetting the name now. I think it was something to the effect of David Dixon or something. I'll find it and probably share it on social media later. Um, the song was about humility, how, you know, I might not have all the answers. I might not know everything. I never will. But the first place it's going to start, and it's going to start today, is with me admitting that I've been, you know, that I need to enter in humbly. And I was like, wow, that's exactly what we've been saying here on the program. So it was like, at that point, you would imagine my spiritual ears were open. You know, I was like, all right, God, you know, speak. Your servant is listening. And uh, sure enough, the next song was about the father's house. And I almost skipped past it. You know, I almost like clicked. Sit. I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back up. Let's listen to the song. So I, I listened to it. And sure enough, it's talking about how there's love and forgiveness in the father's house that you no longer have to feel ashamed. You no longer have to feel, uh, you know, cursed, but you're in the father's house and there's love and forgiveness here. And obviously, you know what I'm getting at. Well, wait a minute. Jesus said, I'm going to leave and I'm going to take you to be where I am in my father's house. So my question, obviously, I'm listening to this worship song and I'm saying, okay, so are we in the father's house or not? If we are in the father's house, that's the preterist ethic. That's what we mentioned yesterday. You know, that's what we're saying. That now we don't have to wait for the, you know, the judgment to be unashamed, but rather we're living in the reality now. Amen. And I sat there and I listened to these worship songs, and I know many others have said this before, that contemporary Christian music is definitely leaning in the direction of a preterist understanding, a preterist ethic. The next song, no lie, brother, I'm not making this up. You know, you want to talk about two or three witnesses. The next song was a song about his presence. And how his presence is with us. I was like, man, I can't make this stuff up. So, uh, you know, again, and the reason I say that is because that's what the old covenant was hoping for. Amen. And yet here you have these Christian singers, which, again, I thought was so beautiful, singing that we have these promises. And I'm saying amen. You know, I'm driving in my car. I went to the gym early this morning, you know, driving in my car. Just, wow, praise God. You know, what a way to start a good Friday. Amen. Amen. And, and, I, and I believe in a way to attain these promises is a quote uh, from the uh, John Maxwell team who said, we cannot become what we need to be, remaining what we are. Mm. That's right. <laughs> right. It's not about going somewhere else, becoming something else, but rather finding what's, it, what's within. Matter of fact, what does Colossians 1 say? The hope of glory is Christ within you. Amen. You know, that that's the hope of glory. So uh, you know, again, I hope those thoughts alone should make it a good Friday for us and, uh, you know, lead us in on uh, some good thoughts. So here we are. We're talking about Passover. 
Now, Good Friday and Passover, there's an interesting correlation. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we read that Christ is our Passover lamb. Now, for those that are listening, let's help them get a little bit of a handle here. And of course, it's important for us to mention, we have a resource on the Feast of the Lord that you could go back to and you could go through all the seven feasts of Israel and, and learn about the context, the historical context, the applicational context, if you will, and uh, how it all applied to Christ. So Passover uh, is this feast where, uh, matter of fact, Edward, if you don't mind, you know, when you first came on the program, our first series was the feast of the lord so yeah. and the reason i did that was because i had asked you uh edward what topics do you think are foundational to a good understanding of preterism and you responded with the feast of the lord so and i know so many of right now are probably tuned in saying amen because again it is it's so foundational if we understand the feast of the lord what israel repeated year after year you get a very healthy understanding of god's will god's plan you know, the redemptive, the, the scheme of things, so to speak. So I, I'm curious, how would you outline to someone why understanding the feasts are important? And then if you don't mind, can you lean us in on a little bit of your understanding of the Feast of Passover? Okay. I believe the feasts are important because um, they they uh, inadvertently were, were, by repeating this and celebrating these feast days, uh, they were celebrating Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ fulfilled the, the feast days. You know, he was the fulfillment. So each of the feast days has something to do with his fulfilling, you know, each one of them. So uh, that's what I believe, you know, why it's so important. And my understanding of Passover is that um, when, when the blood was sprinkled on the doorpost that the angel of death would pass by. Uh, um, and then you had Jesus Christ on the cross when he, the shedding of his blood and trusting in him, uh, you pass from death to life. Uh, you, you, uh, the death angel can't seize you because you have everlasting life. Amen. I want to, uh, I just want to put some feet to what you said there. Uh, in Colossians chapter two, it says this, it says, therefore, no one is, this is Colossians chapter two, verse 16. Matter of fact, I'm just going to write this down. There's a couple other texts that come to mind too, but I'm going to focus on this. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or respect to a festival. Here we are. Remember I said, Chag Samiak. A happy festival. Uh, here's Passover is a festival, one of the feasts of the Lord that were uh, obligation. And when you go back to the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy, books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And here it says, continuing into 16 again, uh, respect to a festival, a new moon or the Sabbath day, which things which are a mere shadow of that which is to come. But the substance belongs to Christ. So again, as Edward was saying, that the old covenant promise was Christ. Now, in the New Testament, we come to understand that Christ is the filter through which all of these feasts were pointing to. Uh, Christ is the Passover lamb, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. So uh, the feasts are so important. And again, I believe from a very natural standpoint, it was to remind Israel every year of the theological lessons behind each of these feasts. For example, Passover. Uh, you know, matter of fact, if I may, but I told you we're, it's Good Friday right now. Passover begins. Passover begins later this evening. So, yeah. Good Friday. Let's talk about that real quickly. The, the theological lesson behind Good Friday. Well, now see, now I'm in a conundrum here. I have to mention Passover first because Passover points to Christ. So, uh, you know, again, shows you the importance of starting with the foundation of the Jewish things and how they were, you know, there. So again, Passover. When Israel comes out of bondage, God, and, and we see sacrifices offered again and again prior to the Egyptian captivity, but either way, uh, when the Israel comes out of Egypt, they, they do this event where they wipe the, well, before they come out of Egypt, sorry about that, the last plague, if you will, uh, they wipe a, the blood on their doorpost of a sacrificial lamb, and they, they wipe it on their doorpost, and it represents that the, the Lord, as Edward mentioned before, the Lord is going to pass over them. The destroyer, however you qualify that, was not going to enter into their homes and uh, and kill their firstborn, which was done to Egypt. Now, uh, the Jews were to celebrate this every year to remember this 
uh, event by having a sacrificial lamb, which none of its bones were to be broken. Uh, interesting uh, allusion there. And um, they were to do this event and then to celebrate, you know, the Passover event with the Seder, what we see Christ celebrating with his disciples uh, the night before he was betrayed. And which was ultimately in the traditional church, it celebrated yesterday or, or noted yesterday, if you will. And I have some messages, matter of fact, I'm going to post a thing up, Passover, Good Friday, Passover and Preterism is going to be the name of the blog. And if you go through that, I'm going to have a link to the Feast of the Lord resource we mentioned before. I'll have some links in regards to my Good Friday sermons, uh, you, you know, that I preached basically good advice for a Good Friday and uh, really just getting at death to self as Christ represented the way that uh, what I wrote here was what, why did a sacrifice need to die? What's the theological lesson? And you know, Edward, uh, may, you may remember this about my testimony. That was a big problem for me coming into Christianity was, uh, you know, why, why this, why does something need to die anyway? I never quite understood that. And then when I was able, able to understand how God made himself known to the Hebrew people through this system called the law of Moses, and he used that to help exemplify who he is or help show who he is. That helped me better understand what Christianity is saying about Christ being a necessary sacrifice. And I wrote here in my notes, what, the, what was the theological lesson? Well, the theological lesson of a sacrifice is death to self, that it's bigger than you. It's beyond you. You've committed something. You've done wrong. And then ultimately, when you die to yourself, you provide yourself. This was alluded to by... Uh, Alvin Dixon, as well as Reese Maggard, uh, when you die to yourself, you give yourself the opportunity for resurrection. You see, you have to die to have resurrection. So, uh, you, you know, again, I, I teach some of this in my, uh, my sermon, The Good Advice for a Good Friday. So I encourage people to lean in on that. Uh, let today be a day of renewal, renewal and self-examination as we see the correlation of two traditional holidays, Good Friday for the Catholic Christian community and Passover for the Jewish community, both offering up self-reflection of sacrifice. Is and it Paul that said, um, I die to myself daily? That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So it's, a, it's an ethic. That's, that's the point. It carries mm -hmm. on from the Jewish understanding of the feast, uh, notably here, the feast of Passover, where they're killing a lamb. The lamb is taking on their necessary death, and they're wiping the lamb's blood rather than their own blood on the doorpost. Uh, again, representing, you know, but my point is what, why the sacrifice was needed was death to self, was to highlight that something needs to die in order to experience resurrection. Now, it could be the animal or it could be you. The sacrifice God truly wants, as we know, uh, what he was trying to do throughout that entire system was to show them that he didn't want bulls and goats blood. He wanted his people to have a broken and contrite heart and, and to be obedient to him. Because I know in the Old Testament, um, the purpose of uh, the shedding of blood is because there's no remission of sins without shedding of blood. Because if you notice, uh, life is in the blood. Mm. Life is in the right. blood. So, uh, you know, he, they started with the, the animal sacrifices and then that was yearly and they still had that condemnation until Jesus Christ with his uh, sacrifice once and for all, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So there's right. no more condemnation. You don't have to do it yearly. You know, so, you know, you have life and you have it to the full. That's right. Amen. Amen. Praise God for that perfect sacrifice. Now, uh, I want to help us get a better handle on what, what's going on with Passover. So, uh, as I mentioned, we have a host of resources for you. Uh, as I did a little bit of research this morning, uh, some resources I can particularly point out regarding Passover that I have uh, would be a resource going through Josephus's writing. Josephus wrote quite a bit about Passover. And I'm going to share with you some of the things he mentioned. Also, some of you might know that I have a blog titled A Spiritually Discerned Passover uh, that I encourage you to go ahead and review. Uh, I'll share that link as well. That's at my blog, nianogonewild.wordpress.com. And then also, you might avail yourself the opportunity to go through Passover readings today. Uh, two websites that I found. One is kabad.com uh, or kabad.org. And at kabad.org, they have um, a summary of the Passover readings. Like, for example, on the first day of Passover, we would read, which we're going to read here in a moment, Exodus chapter 12, uh, verses 21 through 51. 
We'll go ahead and do the traditional work there. Uh, this is the bringing in of the Passover offering in Egypt, the plague of the firstborn at the stroke of midnight, and how on this very day God took the children of Israel out of Egypt. Uh, and again, we don't know, they weren't in the promised land yet. However, they're being brought out of Egypt. Then, of course, there's second day reading. Then there's readings for the intermediate, uh, in, intermediate days of Passover and so forth. That's at kabad.org. I'll share that link later. And then also, as I mentioned, Elder Steve Hernandez, who, by the way, I ask uh, everyone to keep Brother Steve in prayer. Uh, he can use it. We'll just keep it at that. And um, as we're praying for him and appreciating the insight he shared, this past Sunday, he mentioned uh, Torah Portions, uh, a website called TorahPortionsFFOZ.org. Again, I'll make this available to everyone. And what's neat about this Torah portion reading is that you can read it, you can have it read to you, and then it also has correlating text. It brings you to what the Jews call the half Torah, which is the accompanying reading from the, the writings and the prophets for the, the reading of the Law of Moses. Uh, as many of you know, uh, for the season of Lent, we've been reading through the Law of Moses for 40 days through the five books. And uh, so again, this is a great way to do that. You get the little portion read to you. And, and then um, also you get a New Testament text, which is interesting. And then today, for example, the text brought us to John chapter 19. Uh, and that's what got, ultimately got me thinking about Christ's body not being broken. So I'll make all of those resources available to everyone. And uh, if, that, if you don't mind, Edward, I'm going to take our attention over to Exodus 12. Have us read through uh, this reading for Passover, uh, the first day here, and then continue our discussion talking a little bit about uh, the fe Passover feast. We're in Exodus 12, verse 21. And Edward, if you don't mind, uh, you mind bouncing around a bit here? I'll take, uh, I'll read. 21 to 31. I'll ask you to read 31 to 41, and then I'll finish with 41 to 51. Sure. 10 verses each. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Starting at verse 21. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood, which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts. And none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through and smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord has given you, he, as he promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes and the people bowed low and worshiped. Then the son of his sons of Israel went and did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron did and Moses and Aaron. So they did. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the, in the dungeon and the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where, he was, where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out, out, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel and go worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in a hurry for they said, we will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened uh, with their kneading bowls bound up in the cloths of their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, but they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Therefore, they plundered the Egyptians. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from 
Ramses to Sukkot, uh, about 600,000 men on foot aside from children. And mixed multitudes uh, also went up with them along the flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. And they baked the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not, for it had no yeast. Since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, or had they prepared any provisions for themselves? Read 40? 40, please. Okay, now the time that the sons of Israel had lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the host of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be observed for the Lord having brought them out from the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all their sons of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is an ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it, but every man's slave purchased with money. After you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised and let them come near to celebrate it. And then he shall be a native of the land, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. Then all the sons of Israel did so. They did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on the same day of the Lord, and on the same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. So, so before I run, I wanted to go to, uh, to uh, verse 46, where it talks about uh, not to bring any of the meat outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. We mm. know Christ had not a bone broken in him, on him. So I just thought that was wonderful. Yeah, so, again, beautiful, beautiful detail that shows he is our Passover lamb. Again, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Uh, Edward, thank you for being with us. I hope that you'll... Uh, You'll review the program as I'll be sharing a little bit more in regards to Passover. And I look forward to uh, celebrating our dinner with you tonight. Amen. Thank you. All right. God bless you, brother. Uh, for those of you that are tuned in, of course, I do hope that you might find yourself in an assembly going through what they call the storytelling of Passover. The Haggadah uh, is what the Jews often uh, use. We use a Messianic Haggadah yearly here at the Blue Point Bible Church as often as we can. Uh, not We do it religiously, but we don't do it legalistically, if you will. And um, we get in on that, that festival. So I hope that you might find yourself doing that. Some things I'd like to highlight from the reading we just offered up. If you notice, this is a time of trial. Passover marks out a time of trial. It marks out that coming out of bondage and going into freedom is not easy. Uh, again, you notice, well, why does it keep repeating that they, they fled so quickly that they didn't even have time to bake their bread? You know, they, they, this is not a time of rejoicing at that, you know, this moment. This is a time of fret and anxiety. You know, make sure we do the lamb, get the blood on the post. And they would do this every year. You know, let's praise God. That's why the book of Hebrews gets at the fact that well, this is not something we do again and again. Uh, you know, it was done once and for all on our behalf by Christ Jesus. Let's praise God for that. Uh, what I notice as we continue reading through the text is uh, here, uh, by the way, I'm using my notes from Josephus. Josephus gets in on uh, quite a few details that are highlighted by the Feast of Passover. He talks about it being a time of trial, uh, marking out coming out of bondage and into freedom. He marks out that there's offerings of hope that are given up. Uh, examination and renewal is a very important thing regarding the Feast of Passover. And if you notice, for example, uh, what God did here was he gave them favor in the sight of the Egyptians. So uh, there were obviously some Egyptians that were doing some renewal in and of themselves. This was this event caused, and again, anytime God acts in such a magnificent and wonderful way, uh, an exacting way, uh, that should cause examination and renewal. That's why we celebrate the Lord's table. Uh, that it's a time if we were truly taking in the moment and saying, we are the embodiment of God's presence in this world. We are the healing of the nations. Let us examine ourselves. Let us be mindful of, of, of what we're saying and what we're doing and what we're living in. 
And uh, so I believe that's what's happening here with Passover. Glad to see that Josephus marks out the same. And then, of course, the mixed multitude joining with them means that some even, not only did they find favor in saying, you know, here, you can have my belongings, but they said, we want to join with you. You know, you think of the story of Ruth and Naomi, right? I want to go with you and let your people be my people and your God be my God. Again, a very beautiful picture coming out of the Passover scene. Uh, and then, of course, the whole story is about God's faithfulness on display. I marked out verse 41. And at the end of 430 years to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And again, we saw that repeated in verse 51, uh, that they went out. This is the, the faithfulness of God. God put them in bondage and would take them out. He would be their God and they would be his people. And he was doing that. He was leading them into this time of trial. We've been marking out that text from Jeremiah 29, 11, very akin to the reality of uh, the Exodus, you know, of, of being in Egypt for 430 years. There's a whole teaching the rabbis go on about the 430. Um, it's escaping me right now. However, there is a teaching about that, a prophetic detail, if you will, from the 430. Uh, then also, of course, God did mighty things for his people on Passover. That's what was often noted. And you see that here as he's leading the people out. Uh, out of bondage. Uh, some other interesting things that Josephus marks out. Now, these are not so much, I don't know if they're history or tradition, but Josephus does mark these out in his writings that the fall of Jericho took place on Passover, that uh, Hezekiah restored the celebration of pa Passover, which was a historical detail you find in the book of Kings. Josiah's reforms uh, took place on Passover. Uh, then we see the Roman Jewish War having its, uh, the rebuilding of the temple, uh, the, the second temple uh, was, uh, according to Ezra 6, uh, you know, during a beginning of Passover. And then, of course, the Roman Jewish war, there was a lot going on. Well, we see the crucifixion of Christ, uh, Passover, and then, of course, uh, some events during the AD 70 Passover. Uh, the, there was the Roman Jewish war and uh, some five-month story there uh, that Josephus recounts. So, uh, to AD, obviously, the August, uh, the Tabernacles. Uh, again, another beautiful illusion we see in the Feast of the Lord. So uh, Josephus has a lot to say. I mentioned I have a podcast. I used to do a podcast going through Josephus's writings entitled The Chronicles of Josephus. I'm glad to say that I recorded and kept some of those recordings. So I'll make that available to everyone in our blog that we post a little bit later today. Uh, we've also mentioned a spiritually discerned Passover, a blog that I've written, and I mentioned the Passover readings. Uh, as I did a little bit of review here, uh, I noticed uh, Edward and I, when we went through our series, we did this week after week, uh, talking through the Feast of the Lord, uh, obviously using some great resources from Dr. Don K. Preston, uh, great resources from Pastor Dave Curtis from Berean Bible Church, and uh, we've been using the, you know, and then a, a host of other things we were able to find through study. And uh, we use these as our foundation, and then we just continued to study and mark out more and more resources. So that that link we keep mentioning, the Feast of the Lord, uh, that's found at the Power of Preterism Network. It's it's not to be taken lightly. It's full of chalk, full of resources, if you will. Uh, but as we went through this, I marked out a. Uh, we talked about Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and we highlighted sort of what they meant and what they meant applicationally for us as Christians. And regarding Passover, we said that Passover points to our redemption in Christ Jesus, and it's the obtaining of a clear conscience. It's, you know, the people knew at that very moment when the Lord acted here in Exodus 12, God is on our side. God is going before us. He's going to be our, 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 our front shield and going to be our rear guard. And they, they, this gave them a conscience. This gave, this made people say, we want to be with those people. We want to make your God our God. And you notice what I find beautiful every time I read through this is, uh, you know, and they were, they did all that the Lord commanded them. You know, those are beautiful texts to mark out because how little do we see them in scripture? Dare I say, how little do we see them in our lives? Maybe that's time for us to examine it. Or, or there are more moments in my life where the, the testimony is, and he did according to what the Lord had said, or there are more, more, more moments in my life where it's, and he didn't do what the Lord had said, and then this happened. That's what we see all throughout the Old Testament. I just saw somebody testifying to that uh, this morning, and even testifying to the betrayer, the betrayal of, of course, uh, Judas, and the betrayal of Peter that follows uh, historically in these days that we're looking at. And then, of course, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which shortly follows Passover. It's the next day. Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, we marked out was about influence. Leaven is often used in scripture as influence. And we said that we want to uh, have our influence by and in Christ Jesus. Uh, we want to eat of his flesh, so to speak, and have our mind, having the mind of Christ. And uh, that was our 
our understanding of the, the unleavened bread and how it applies to us as Christians today. So uh, I hope that we've given you some things to think about for this uh, Good Friday, this uh, Passover. Uh, so, you know, the Passover being fulfilled in Christ. And again, uh, as soon as we end this program, I'll work on getting the Beyond Creation Science resources to everyone uh, that we had uh, mentioned. Uh, and also, um, I'll type this blog up so you can avail yourself to these, uh, these resources as we continue through Good Friday and into Passover. So I'm going to unmute some mics. Uh, if anybody has any comments, questions, concerns, uh, things that you'd like to bring up uh, here for our hour of power. And then after all of that, I'll close out with some closing announcements. And I think we've mentioned quite a few resources today. If you see your mic unmuted, you can go ahead and share any questions, comments, concerns. Don't feel obligated. I do thank those of you that are tuned in through our uh, online uh, session here. Thank you for tuning in. I see we have uh, quite a few people watching and some good comments. Glad Jonathan Butchery appreciated uh, my thought there about it's not it's not about going somewhere else or becoming something else, but rather to find what and who is within. That's right. Amen, brother. Glad that you appreciated that thought. All right. Well, uh, I look forward to further chatting with folks about this tonight as we have our Messianic Seder here at the Blue Point Bible Church. Again, I will exhort you. I hope that you find yourself in community using some sort of way of talking with others or maybe finding these resources that we've mentioned here as a part of your day today as we talk through the uh, as we go through the Good Friday and the Feast of Passover. Just to end my thought here something I've said in my, in my blog that I wrote on a spiritually discerned Passover in this regard, I said, presuppositional thought and just plain ignorance has led many Christians to misidentify the elements of restoration. Again, alluding back to that quote I shared from Max King, in order to understand the new covenant and the reality that we have, we must go back and understand the old covenant and the elements thereof. So uh, pre presuming we know that without doing any study is obviously problematic. And then most people don't even understand that. Uh, that, that, that why that would be problematic. That's problematic. This surely affects the ability of spiritual discernment. Christians should be celebrating an entirely fulfilled Passover, celebrating our lives, our living in and identifying with the new Jerusalem, praising God for the glorified body of Christ, otherwise known as the church, and resting in the new heavens and new earth, all spiritually discerned realities. I went on to say another time, as again, today is Flashback Friday, so I looked through my time hop and found some comments. I said this a while back, as I think through a convo I had this morning about the infamous problem of pain and also contemplate the reality of the Passover, I say Deyenu. Deyenu is what we will be reciting during our celebration or Haggadah tor telling tonight during the Messianic Seder, and it's what the Jews celebrate during Passover. They say Deyenu. And what it means is it would have been sufficient. They go through, uh, you know, if the Lord would have simply taken us out of or given us a sacrificial lamb, but did not take us out of Egypt, it would have been sufficient. If the Lord would have led us into the wilderness, but not led us into the promised land, it would have been sufficient. Again, giving us an attitude of gratitude, giving us an appreciation for what we have rather than a lack of appreciation for what we don't have. And you know, again, so marking out Deenu, it is sufficient, uh, is an important thing as a Christian to know that all things have been given to me pertaining to life and godliness, to testify to the truth of scripture. I, I continued that thought and I said, the fact that so many disregard all that Christ has accomplished in an effort to demand what they desire shows that we still have a lot of maturity to find even within the Christian community. So I pray that our efforts lead you to that. I pray that we edify you, we encourage you, we build you up, and we push you to continue to be consistent in regards to the Christian ethic that we understand and the Christian ethic that we endeavor to live. A quick announcement. Again, I highlight go to powerofpreterism.wordpress.com later today to go ahead and get our blogs uh, that we'll be putting up about uh, Passover, Good Friday, and Preterism uh, that will highlight all the resources mentioned herein. And then, of course, I do want to mention in uh, next week, for that matter, uh, I will be speaking with Brother Ward Fenley at the Prospect Baptist Church. I'm just going ahead and digging up the graphic that we've been sharing for that conference. And that will be 
let me pull it up so I don't give the wrong announcements. The conference is April 23rd and the 24th. That will be Prospect Baptist Church in Sullivan, Alabama. Uh, that's 1570 Prospect Road, Sullivan, Alabama, for those that want the particulars. Uh, the service will start at 10 a.m. each day. Uh, both of us will have time to speak. Uh, I believe I'll be speaking the one day and then speaking the other. We'll have lunch at 12, and then we're going to have a roundtable Q&A at 1.30 p.m. on both days. So we want to encourage you to come on out, join us for a time of conference and fellowship as we bring forth edifying teachings and prayerfully live edifying times together. Uh, that's the announcement I have for now. There is, of course, uh, the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend uh, coming up online. That will be in July. Uh, there's a host to do here at the Blue Point Bible Church uh, for the month of May, and um, we'll be keeping you abreast with other conferences that are developing. Uh, there's potential for to see some conferences happening in later in the year, in October, November, uh, so I will keep everybody informed. So thank you for tuning into our program this morning. I pray that this was an hour of power for you, and I pray that you continue to go through your day praising God for being uh, for, for providing our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, and living a good Friday. Go in peace. God bless.